Hi, welcome and welcome to Outgaze Film Festival. We're honored and thrilled that you've joined us for Outgaze Film Festival, a virtual look at embodiment, inclusivity, and resilience. A festival featuring 14 films from local and international filmmakers and four virtual events. Outgaze Film Festival is our offering in this moment of resistance. Outgaze is a collaboration of directors, filmmakers, and film enthusiasts. We're also voters, and we encourage you to get a plan for November 3rd and vote. My name is Amy Irvin, co-director of Outgaze Film Festival. I'm excited to welcome you to this inaugural Feminist Film Festival and our first film panel discussion, Vision and the Body in Queer Feminist Cinema, featuring filmmaker Susan Uravinen, director of Leakage, and Lucia Honey, director of The Bottom and Noise Opera. Today, we're also joined by co-director and programmer Amanda Sanfilippo and programmer Meryl Merman. Meryl Merman is a choreographer, filmmaker, and curator. Her queer films and choreographies derived from experiments at the intersection of cinema and dance disrupt popular notions of spectacle, the body, virtuosity, and gender. Amanda Sanfilippo is a longtime performance and visual artist, as well as a birth doula and educator. She teaches adult sex education at the Borberg Theater School in New Orleans. A special shout out to Chris Hammersley, Outgaze's talented tech and operations guy working behind the scenes. Outgaze Film Festival is produced by Creative Community League, a project of Amanda Sanfilippo and myself, Amy Irvin. The festival is also sponsored by Feminist Majority Foundation, New Orleans Film Society, WHIVFM New Orleans and Zeitgeist Theater and Lounge. Films Leakage and The Bottom and Noise Opera, two films that unveil the mystery, humor, pain, and pleasure of human desire, are included in the Visions in the Dark film block. Please view these and all our offerings through October 31st. Before we begin the conversation, I want to give a heartfelt welcome to acclaimed director and actress Mariana Polka our moderator for this film discussion. Hi hey guys, I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I love cinema. <laughs> hey, thank you for joining us so much. Recently oh, named on IndieWire's list of the 20 rising female filmmakers you need to know, Mariana Palka has earned critical acclaim from the Los Angeles Times and New York Times, as well as numerous accolades for her films, including Good Dick, the Lion's Mouth Opens, and Egg. She has gained prestige for her roles in Mississippi Requiem, Good Omens, mm -hmm. Girls, and the Emmy-winning Netflix original, Glow. Yes, We're good. honored to have her join the festival for this panel discussion, Vision and the Body in Queer Feminist Cinema. Thank you and welcome, Mariana Palka. I'm so happy, I really am so happy to be here and I feel all of those um, experiences have led me to this day to do this panel. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're thrilled to have doing. you, and as we were discussing a little bit before joining everyone, uh, there's nothing better to do on a Saturday afternoon in the U.S. as watch a film and listen to a panel discussion. So if you're mm -hmm. not out there early voting, we hope you're joining us here at Outgaze. I think we're going to be joined shortly by our panelists. Mm -hmm. And they're so amazing. Everyone's amazing. And I was watching the films and the films are so good. So we have to talk about it. Yeah, there's lots to talk about. <laughs> there they are. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, Mariana and Amy. <laughs> Hello. 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 Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> oh my God. All these amazing people in one place. <laughs> so amazing. You guys made such beautiful movies. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad I was able to watch Leakage last night. Yay. Yeah. yeah. That is so cool. You guys watched each other's movies. That's so awesome. Yeah. yeah. It's really good. You know, I was watching. Um, all your, uh, Mariana, I was watching all your interviews in the past few days and they were amazing, <laughs> really. Yeah. Hey, and, uh, thank you. Your documentary, I, I mean, I'm going to message you later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all going to my mom's house after this. 
<laughs> Lovely. Yeah. But I do think that uh, my films and your guys' movies are actually the same thing. I, I was really moved because I felt like if I was in your bodies, having your life experiences, I would have made the films that you guys made. And I think that's unique. I don't think people make the kind of films that we're making. And I think people need to make more of the films that you guys have made um, because it heals the world and it helps the world specifically in America today. It's very, very, very important. And around the world, obviously, I think it's important to be doing what I kind of see as political activist cinema, which obviously you guys did. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. It's just superb. I'm really honored to meet you guys. I'm honored to meet you too. Or all, everyone. <laughs> everyone. <Thank you. laughs> Lucia, I just want to say I think I met you. Uh, you had a wig sale a couple years yes. ago, and I came with Aaron, and I got some really fabulous wigs. So. <laughs> I remember it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was last year, right before Mardi Gras. Exactly. Yeah. So but I was trying I, to dehoard my life. So. You did a good job, but I love the wigs that you had in the film too. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, we're all jealous of those wigs. <laughs> yeah. You can borrow them. I'll send them in the mail. Did you guys have the instinct to do what you're doing from childhood? Were you always going to be filmmakers? How did it start for you guys? Hmm. Oh, me, I started with, I mean, I mean, from my childhood, I don't really remember that. <laughs> but... Um, I started with architecture. I mean, I studied architecture, but then everything, I mean, has changed when I decided to study cinema suddenly. I mean, yeah. Yeah, and for me, I, um, I've i been an artist since I was very young, um, but it was more like two-dimensional visual art, being like a painter. And then I got into sculpture from there and then performance, and then I went to school for performance. And that's where I got into doing more video work because um, there's just another way to document that stuff. And then moving here, I got into music and that brought me to making kind of like abstract music videos and things along that nature. But I would like to in the future make a feature length film. Um, it's just, yeah, I haven't done that. <laughs> yeah, you definitely are a feature director. For the power of your short, it's like could be expanded as well into future. Cool. <laughs> That's <Definitely. nice> <laughs> Yeah, I would love to do something along those lines. I'm very much an avid lover of um, what cinema means for the people and the people who are watching, we're so happy. Whoever's watching, we're very excited that you're here. And um, the idea that people can ask you questions is so fun. So um, it's just gonna be such an amazing moment. Um, but I was wondering as well, cause I think that with the female gaze specifically, um, I, I don't think you have to be a woman um, or born a woman to to do the female gaze. You know, I think that Almodovar has been doing the female gaze in cinema better mm. than any of us. Like, I really feel like Almodovar is a better female filmmaker than than I am. <laughs> and I think every country has their, their Almodovar and then every country has their um, other people who are making film that is as good as the films that you guys made. But do you think that um, your countries of birth decided for you a little bit the kind of movies you were going to make or do you feel like you are speaking to it more than it's being like a reaction to the places you grew up yeah I guess for me it's somewhat a reaction to like where I grew up and then what that is in comparison to any place that I've traveled to um wow. like traveling to Latin America or traveling to Europe or once when I was 15, I went to Japan, which is probably the furthest I've been from home. Um, but I, I think any sort of travel has seriously influenced um, the type of work I make and then informs, yeah, the type of the landscapes that appear in my videos, which are kind of response to what I see when I'm there. Um, and I'm a huge element of our film. Fan. Um, all through quarantine, I've kind of been on a marathon with my partner watching Almodovar films. <laughs> um, Can we talk so, about it? I mean, yeah. like, in cinema, I'm like, that's the next level cinema. Almodovar's yeah. on that level. <laughs> yeah. Tie me up, tie me down. Almodovar's film is 
just mm. exquisite. It has the best sex scene if we're allowed to say sex scene at twelve o'clock <laughs> on a Saturday afternoon in America. I think so. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the sex scene. Anytime, any time. Any time. In all of our movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, every day, all the time. Um, just very cinematic, you know, and filled with yeah. eroticism. You know, I think there's so much space for eroticism and how far to go with that. It's beautiful too. Yeah, um, and this kind of like that. elegant camp. Like it takes it a little yes. bit beyond yes. what camp is typically, and yeah, there's like yeah. the elegance to it that I really appreciate. It's exquisite. It's exquisite. Awesome. What about you, Susan? Do you feel like where you grew up is yeah. part of who you are as a uh, I think, yeah, I was born in Iran and I grew up in a culture of <laughs> kind of culture of excess. And uh, it comes always with that kind of absurdity as well. And uh, mm -hmm. um, Actually, it's a kind of, I can say, it's a clashes of forces. No, like a multi-layer uh, forces, you know, um, in the history of the region that really made me, you know, like, so it's like religious backgrounds, all the superstitions and everything. And, you know, uh, uh, fear of male and anxiety of living with the car foreigners you know these are all the things that um i think the history of i mean the landscape the, the history of the territory that i live in i think really mm -hmm. affected what i uh, reflected on this time yeah that's so cool do you feel like the history of iranian cinema also has something to do with what you're doing do you think you would have made the same film if you hadn't seen those movies or do you think um, um, the opposite. Is true. Yes, I mean, I mean, yeah. I think the history of the Iranian cinema also, and also the laws and the rules. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they, they are. I mean, which are um, always in your mind. I mean, when I was writing my script, I my my dad. I remember my dad was uh, encouraging me to use a male protagonist. Because it was much easier to shot to the show. heart, Dad. Shot to the heart there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it was e <laughs> like easier to, to show a, you know, a man, um, yeah, urinating oil. <laughs> so uh, at least I could shoot him from behind, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, yeah. I I couldn't persuade myself. I wanted to be a female character. I mean that that that's why yeah. So. Yeah, it's yeah. We really need more of the female characters. Um, <laughs> and did your dad watch it now? And did he feel like he's um, um, seen he what he always... can from your interpretation of what cinema is to you? Uh, what's that? Did he watch your movie and have a reaction to it? He yeah, he watched it, and he still thinks that uh, the protagonist <laughs> should be the male character because um, he he thought that I should have shown more of oil, you know, coming out of body, and I I didn't want to to show that, you know. I mean, uh, I, I will tell you later why. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I know why, you know. Um, <laughs> That's so incredible. I want to get you a hat that I have. It's a cap. It's like a baseball cap. And just on the top of it, it says, Daddy, please. Yeah. And I give it to like every friend I have. Like everyone I know, I give them the Daddy, please hat because it's like, yeah. Daddy, like seriously, please. Oh. <laughs> it's loaded. Yeah, it's like, I'm, it's everything. That hat is everything. <laughs> And also, it's funny to me, like, if we give you the daddy please hat, then we can maybe even put it in his language, and then also he could wear it himself, and that would be very, <laughs> very deep. <laughs> but I love that as a message. And I do think that the film's so powerful, and it's got a lot of cinematic truth to it in the sense of its way that it's crafted and how elegant it is on a cinematic field like it really kind of works um in terms of the way that it's it's so constructed in this high-end reality and are, are you feeling like as a filmmaker you want to do more films there or here or like you know where do you want to do the rest of your career as you're as you're figuring it out do you have a 
a wish list of places I, you want to make movies? I myself, I really think that it really depends on on the content of the scenario, the next scenario that I'm going to write. I mean, sure, sure. it really depends on that. I mean, even the structure of the narrative that I used for leakage, I think it's somehow a kind of incoherent one, um, but uh, maybe based on the you know subject matter, I think it really depends on that. Yeah, because I think a non-linear narrative is very important to what yeah. you guys are doing. And I could cry about why we need more non-linear narratives. I, I really think that there's a difference between the male orgasm traditional uh, version of a story structure where it's like one climax and then an ending. It's different than yeah. a number of climaxes and maybe no beginning, no end, and it just goes on forever. Like the female orgasm doesn't ever end. Yeah. Like we're... Just constantly having an orgasm for the rest of our lives. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's reflected, I think, in the male gaze versus the female gaze of cinema, regardless of whether or not it's like non-linear or, or linear narrative. I, I like to see things in, in that way, kind of psychologically, what's happening for the filmmaker and, and why they make the film that they've made. And I think that the more people can, can watch and be inspired by your movies um, into the future, that's going to be so interesting what you guys do because I'm going to be watching it all. <laughs> yeah. Really, like, it's going to be crazy. <laughs> like, you guys are taking on the world and I really appreciate it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Does it feel like that when you get out of bed in the morning or you're like, wow, we're superhero filmmakers. And <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I, feel, I feel like I'm on a path to go towards the things I meant to do in life. And yeah. It's been like a weird long battle and struggle to get to feel that way, but it's starting to happen in some sense. And it's a weird time for that to start to happen too in the world. Um, like a very complicated moment to feel that. <laughs> Particularly in this country, because it feels like the oppression and repression that always happens to artists is happening on a level that's kind of un- um, precedented to put mm. a ridiculous word on it um, but I, I think what, hen- what ends up happening in those situations is the artists squeeze out of that oppression and make work that maybe they might not have made in a time where they were being revered and financed by the government for example um, <laughs> where you have yeah. to adhere to like, the, the regime of whatever government organization <laughs> I know, because well, I always talked about my, my mom. My mom is a, a like she's the reason why I'm a filmmaker. She's an artist. She's a poet, and she made a lot of um, anti-communist work in in Poland. Mm. As I was growing up, you know, I I was in Scotland, so we also came from a place of understanding culture from that place of how the artist can change the government. Um, and it mm. worked in Poland. It really worked. We saw the overthrowing of the communist regime and it was really special and I feel like that's happening here (laughs) and I think it's happening in Iran I think it's happening around the world you know I think it's happening in Belarus too and I think that artists have to keep going and we have to keep talking to each other and reminding each other with sweetness that this is the best job in the whole world and Mm -hmm. that is really important for the kids who are watching who are out there watching your movies to see that they have um, someone who understands them and someone who loves them and that they can go into the future and make something that we haven't been maybe able to make yet. That's sort of the point I think of being an artist is we have the little kids in the artist world who come in and they're younger, like you guys, because I'm like the (laughs) granny of cinema over here. (laughs) (laughs) You guys are like my grandchildren. <laughs> is that cool if I like just adopt you guys? Yeah, like it. now I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> like that's it, part of the family. Yeah. Um that means you really do have to go to my mom's house because you have to see your great grandmother. <laughs> um yeah, no, I think that when I was growing up there were two kinds of films when I was young. It was really just a good film or a bad film. Mm. And it was really specific. And I think that uh, you guys fall into the good movies category, so you really have to keep making films for the rest of your life. I'm not joking. Okay. Yeah. <sighs> we need it. We need it. We need it. We need it. We need it so much. <laughs> mm. 
also I'm kind of thinking about how to get um, us into the White House and have a screening of your movies. Maybe in the blue room in the White House, would you guys get dressed up for that and be into that if I can make that work? Because I can text a couple people and see. Depends who's in the White House. I know. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, it really depends. <laughs> it's like the pressure of that is like such a thing that we're feeling. It's like a little group therapy session we're having here, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Very intense. <laughs> and what the it's vote means moment. is, yeah, it's a very intense moment. What the vote means for us as citizens in a world. Oh my goodness, this is so exciting because we have a question. Should we ask of a question? Should we open up to a question right now because sure. we have one? Um, so it says, how difficult was it to curate and make choices for the festival? Did you have a checklist of sorts or like more your instincts that's a question for Meryl good question <laughs> um, yeah like are you going on instincts uh, yeah I think I think some of it definitely is intuition um, but we did have some things that we were looking for that I think both of these films really display which have already come up a little bit in the conversation um, a sense of intuition within the filmmaking itself mm -hmm. um, both of these films rely on that poor and kind of poetic language, the essential body as a driving force in the mm -hmm. filmmaking. And um, these, these sort of ideas of, yeah, poetic language or metaphor, the body are um, storytelling devices that we don't always see in more linear, plot-driven, um, dialogue-driven movies that are more kind of male-centered, climax structure, get us to a place kind of filmmaking. Um, I think the strength in particularly these two films is that they allow us to sit with the unknown and um, the kind of the mystery and the esoteric nature of that that is maybe a more misunderstood but um, important feminist and queer aspect to you know, to the queer or feminist experience, I guess. I think so also... Yeah, Amanda's programmed with me, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think also there's this sense of hopelessness um, in both of the films, and that, but it's met with this, uh, like, dark humor and this bravery mm. in the dark humor, mm. and that so much, um, I can speak from my experience as being born into a fat female body, is that we find these um, veils to express um, our struggles. And one of them is humor and one and, and um, display of our sensuality in these veiled ways, but also what you did in the film was brave in and of itself of expressing um, your beauty and dilemmas and all of this through humor and through really explicit sensual visual cinema. And I think that, um, yeah, both of the films had that just in, in curating this block, it was um, beautiful to see how they related in that way. Um, yeah, and that they both illuminate this unspoken, um, and in that way they're transgressive, which I think, mm -hmm. um, Mariana, you speak to, is that mm -hmm. these are, they are political just by being transgressive uh, in these expressions. Um, sorry. Oh, it's sorry. my mom calling you. She's like, are you it's guys doing it? We're doing it. We're doing it. It's actually my daughter calling her mom. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, I feel very lucky that I got to, to experience them and that Meryl and I like have a, also this, uh, you know, the performative aspect of um, the Bottom of Noise opera was so wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, the dark fluid coming out of a, a, a woman's body as being both a resource and also a pollutant and also mm -hmm. um, sticky and intriguing and has so many elements to it. So yeah, I think that this bravery and humor was really a, another aspect that we chose these two together. They're so good together, aren't mm. they? Like, they're so good together. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's a really good choice. When you guys were working, do you have a, a shorthand when you're watching stuff? Uh, do you feel like you're the same brain or you have different opinions? How does it work? It's very fluid between Amanda yeah. and me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was a very circular fun. conversation in a very fluid <laughs> 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 sense. <laughs> Do you feel like yeah. you programmed um, based off of the year that we're in and what's happening in this year? Or do you think this would have happened regardless of the outside forces? And we all know what the outside forces are. That's a really good question. I think that we didn't have a choice that we are just in this time and they spoke to this time at this moment. So I can't say, honestly, from my perspective, I feel like yeah. they were here now. Um, and I feel that's, um, I mean, no matter when I watch these films, I feel like they'll be timeless in yeah. their relevancy. They are. Yeah. yeah. They really that's are. how I feel too. But there's a timelessness to these two films in some ways because of that mystery that um, mm. they're pointing us back to a feminine energy that is like not trying to get us somewhere, but allowing us to sit with the unknown and mm. um, revel in kind of the secrets and the shadows of existence. And so in that regard, they're always going to be transgressive and um, timeless, I think. Yeah, they're timeless and also they're timely. Like I do feel like the immigration mm -hmm. aspect the, where there's these layers of immigration conversation mm -hmm. in um, your film, Susan. And then in Lucia, yeah. your film about the telephone, mm -hmm. like, where's my phone? Like. <laughs> You know, and um, this like constant looking in the mirror, like I don't see anything, I'm just looking in this mirror. And I think those are pointed about our time in history and about what's going on in the realms of interpersonal and political aspects and geopolitical, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you guys put that so well. And the idea that the films each are alchemy, you know, I mean, they're so fun in the darkness and so therefore it's quite interesting that you guys have made something that will stand the test of time and show future generations what it felt like to be around this year okay. and how we feel about it <laughs> specifically when you were making it was it funny like was it fun on set and were you guys like laughing <laughs> at, at moments um, so for the, the scenes filmed in Las Vegas I was I was literally drunk to film it. And so that was definitely an experience and like blackout at moments. Um, that's but it was clear. Like, of... I don't remember half of it. So that's <laughs> but it's on camera, which makes that really interesting. That's all that matters. That's um, all that matters. But yeah, and the other moments were filmed in a really different way that were more controlled and like we had a, like a very specific vision mm -hmm. of like shots and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. some people. But yeah, I always try to have fun. <laughs> That's cool. Was it funny for, for you, me? Susan? I think, yeah. <laughs> I mean, funny. I mean, it was You're like it was a laugh. It was a laugh me. a minute. Yeah. <laughs> you know why? Because, um, I mean, um, the city that I live in is, um, is Shiraz is um, located south of Iran, and it is not a hub for filmmaking. Tehran is actually a hub for filmmaking and, you know, you can find equipment, you know, um, the professional crew and, you know, the, the, every, everything that you need is actually there. I remember, um, let me tell you <laughs> my story of Meryl, actually. Uh, I remember <laughs> once uh, I, I came to New Orleans and it was, um, uh, I, I mean, I, I came to this bar and um, I remember Meryl was dancing and, uh, you know, my um, cousin, she told me, he told me that uh, she's a choreographer and she's very professional and she's very talented and she can help you. It was, I'm talking about five years ago. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and she can help you to find, um, you know, a cinematographer. Imagine I was in the US and I was looking for a cinematographer. Uh, so I asked Meryl uh, if you can help me and she introduced a guy from, uh, I mean, a very talented guy from uh, Lebanon. So he wow. came from the US to Iran and uh, he helped me uh, shoot my film. So it was kind of difficult because getting visa was complicated and, you know, the equipment, I mean, it was, I mean, we had to be very creative. 
in, uh, did you get an O one visa? Don't... Is that how that worked out? Uh, sorry, what's that? Did you get an O one visa? Is that how you got the visa? Was it an O one or did uh, you get a different uh, visa? Yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, um, um, the thing was that he gained a tourist visa, sweet, but sweet, sweet. Um, because uh, he couldn't he couldn't get a like a working visa or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So he came with tourist visa. And then um, he extended it. He went back to Lebanon again, and he wow. extended it for another month. So it was kind of complicated, mm -hmm. and the equipment and 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 like all the people in the film that you say, they are friends and family, and uh, no one is really professional except uh, my protagonist, who has some um, you know little background in theater, but he's she's really I mean not professional. So That's amazing. That's amazing. Everything is, uh, I mean, I mean, even like the, all the equipments, I mean, everything uh, comes from our friends and family. And uh, yeah. that was so cool. It takes a village to make so, it all happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Um, we also have another question that's for Susan that says, powerful. This film unfolds in a feminine sense of time. How did you as a filmmaker tap into that feminine sense of time? It's a little bit what we were talking about, about the story structure. Yeah. Um, I mean, is it really a feminine film? <laughs> I don't know that it has to be, um, but the idea that the structure isn't necessarily like, um, you know, the way that other movies are yeah. structured. Yeah, but I think because there is this kind of um, dualistic conceptualization of body. Mm -hmm. um, the dualism is, is really powerful. Exactly. I mean, mm. um, because they, I mean, the, the family that are introduced in the film is um, somehow, they, 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 they rigidly stick to the cliche portrait of uh, women, um, mm -hmm. you know, represented by kind of, uh, you know, uh, the reproductive organs, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, it is very difficult for them to um, kind of think bodies outside the bound which uh, ha have been constituted. So that's why maybe, I mean, there's always this, I mean, a uh, woman, man, masculine, feminine, you know, this thing is going on and you um, always think that um, maybe it's it's a feminine film, but I, I, I don't feel like that. I mean, it's mm -hmm. uh, like um, they don't have that much knowledge about a female body. I mean, um, mm -hmm. I remember um, Meryl once um, uh, said uh, something about lack of knowledge uh, that is in one scene, the one particular scene in this film. Uh, I mean, in this particular scene, um, there's a conversation about, um, you know, when, when, when um, Jale and Leila, they're looking at this report of ultrasound tests and they cannot realize a kidney from a bladder. Mm. So um, that lack of knowledge, I think, uh, you know, you know, gives you the, the sense of that that's dualistic conceptualization of body, that there's always female, male, you know, man, woman, and masculinity and femininity, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's also, in the bladder, they were like, don't say urinate, don't say urinate, it's not proper. Yeah. And, and that was and that. I think, yeah. This this shielding la language is also uh, is it comes from you know as I said before it's it's, it's like the history of me it's like um, is is caused by different um, you know multi layered forces like as I said superstitious the religious things you know like uh, fear of male and everything you know that's why uh, and and it's really strange because they don't want to say uh, the word urine in front of the maid, but at the same time, they're openly talk about uh, oil, which th th they both come from one place. I mean, uh, and but uh, they openly talk about oil, but it, 
it is because of their traditional things, you know, like the thoughts, you know, like, yeah. And those traditional systems that are really passed down ancestrally, so fascinating, the idea that in your films, do you feel like you guys have been influenced by the storytellers in your own family from back in the day, whether or not they were generations above you who were or were not able to tell their stories on a creative level? Do you feel like that's something that influenced you personally as filmmakers? I'd say first, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, personally, I don't know if I know much of the history of my family, not censored, like if anyone had a story that they felt like they didn't, weren't able to tell. Um, but I could think of that more in like, terms of identity or something or like mm -hmm. um, ancestors in a different sense, like in terms of queerness. Or, like the society uh, that wasn't allowed to be in all the generations before. That's gonna make me yeah, cry exactly. as I'm talking. I don't know, it's like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> really kind of like the whole like, history of humanity is your family. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing that makes me cry. Well, um, <laughs> It's really awesome. Tears to it. No, it's, um, beautiful. it's beautiful cinema tears. That's amazing. That's really just, yeah, like capturing, capture, trying to capture a nuanced identity that is maybe not typical, typically seen in media or something. And um, that's also hard to describe and hard to categorize because mm -hmm. it's ambiguous. You're like just like being gender ambiguous in some sense. Mm -hmm. not adhering to one or the other or, or right, being like, like medically so trans um, or non-binary or something. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, there's lots of drift. Mm -hmm. But not sure like in terms of my own like blood family, I don't, I don't know. I just don't know the story that well. <laughs> you know? They weren't storytellers. They were not storytellers. The people no. in your, like your grandparents and all the people like before them weren't necessarily no. doing that. No, and I don't know that much about their lives. Um, I feel like they didn't tell stories very often. And that's something that's like maybe different than other friends, grandparents that I've seen. But, that's cool. Yeah. Um, there's a question for you too, which is what are the ways in which you're oh, breaking down the mainstream notions of virtuosity? Well, Cinematic, <laughs> musical, gender specific ideas of virtuosic aesthetic. Hmm. It's a little oh, yeah. bit in line with what we were just saying. Yeah. Um, yeah, and of course, like, as the filmmaker, I don't know if I would call my film virtuosity. Sure. Uh, like, that's up to a viewer, like, someone else's opinion of what it does. Mm -hmm. um, it felt cathartic for me to do, and I like, needed to express it. Um, but I'll say that, yeah, I had fun playing around with, like, the typical notions of what a narrative are, um, or like a film, or also playing around with the idea of a visual album, because that's another way I frame this project. A visual but... album, wow, it's gorgeous, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's, it's weird because it's not a whole album, and it's actually songs from two different albums that I was like in between at the time. Um, so it's like a bridge between those, um, but trying to form, yeah, very abstract narrative through, through, yeah, telling an abstract story and then using some like, pop imagery in there, but doing it in my own very weird way. Um, and ha to have the story be kind of an unraveling instead of a build to a climax, it's kind of just like deteriorates in the beginning and it keeps going from there. It, it takes you to strange places. Um, we love that. It should always take us to those strange places. We need it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so be. cool that you're doing that it's very curious and open-minded of your your own self as a filmmaker that you can you have the capacity for that it's very good mm. and helpful to the world on a real way so that's yeah, how I, people can interpret it for themselves because you're doing it so well for you so yeah and part of it is just like that's how I think like, I don't think in like a very typical narrative way it's right, just like, innate life seems you. cyclical to me <laughs> Um, yeah. I, I don't I think if I try to tell a narrative story which I've tried to do multiple times it just comes out this way and uh, yeah you're like this is me um, trying to be narrative yeah yeah like, I am. like yeah. totally this is it yeah yeah and like 
I've, I've taken on the task of starting to write a book and I'm like facing this task right now. And it's, it's just bringing out different things for interesting process, but that's a little outside of film. That's cool, yeah. No, I could write like a children's book, but that's it. I can't do anything else. Can't, I wouldn't be able to do a book. I'm too like visual in the cinema realm and that's all I'm built for in a weird way. But um, it's yeah, it's gorgeous. What about you, Susan? Do you feel like the, um, the ancestors and like the other people in your family before you had anything to do with you as a filmmaker with this film storytelling yeah did you feel like you were uh, not, they were not, helping not you my at all? family but 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 no my, not my family but there's something I mean um like in a time when I was at high school um the, you know there's always a circle of friends but there's always a, a one or two friends uh, at that age you know who has you know, have some kind of weird things, you know, coming of age, you know, things about adulthood, you know, that, that they tell you about those things. So once um, there was this girl who, come, who came to us and told us that, uh, okay, guys, you all get your period. And when you get your period, you all bleed, okay? And say, okay. <laughs> and then he, she said, but when I get my period, something else comes out of my body no so way. at that moment yeah that was a really weird thing that yeah. really i mean uh, i was always thinking about her and her body and what, what what could that substance be i mean um and but but she was kind of you know um, I don't know why she, she told us that story. And she's now a very normal person. She's working in a bank right now. And <laughs> when I see her, <laughs> it's, it's amazing when I see her. And, you know, I, I feel feeling out the forums and looking at her and thinking about, you know, her body. But, yeah, that was actually the, the inspiration for, I mean, the, the, the story behind <laughs> uh, what I, you know, had written really. <laughs> That's amazing. That is amazing. I feel like in both of the films that embodiment aspect mm -hmm. is so profound and mm -hmm. that that's what shifts the sense of time for me anyway was like mm -hmm. this deep embodiment and this non-linear or there's cyclical like what you were saying Lucia is this cyclical thing and then with the menstruation and the fact that you used a woman that was past her menstrual time but then goes back into the cyclical sense of resourcing is really unusual yeah. in, in, in cinema yeah. to yeah. have that being have power and have focus and have mystery um, is a really unusual experience and that also like I watched it last night with a bunch of queer radical fairies and they all came up this morning i've been camping out in nature for a month now sleeping under the stars and this morning we came together and the number of questions around how did that work how did the time work wait what was that reference or the layers mm. and layers of meaning in there that came forth um mm. also broke down time right? It broke mm. down into these mythologies. And, and I think yeah. that also happened in, in a, a bottom too, the bottom of noise opera where there was all these like, what's happening? Why are we on Lake Poncha training a rubber ducky right now? You know, like anyway, so. I think there's always, um, um, as Meryl um, mentioned before, there's always this uh, kind of concept of disruption that's happening. Um, in 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 in, in leakage, um, and this notion of disruption, I think, is um, I mean, um, is is happens really when uh, the protagonist leaks oil, but most of the time uh, it acts as some sort of twist in different parts of the narrative, without leaving any trace. I mean, when um, mm. let me put it in this way: when you write about, I mean, when you write a story, um, this uh, disruption in the narrative, I think, can act as a line of departure for characters' development and you know, rendering the story and bringing in new adventures. Uh, but the continuation of the narrative, I think, really depends on what happens after 
you know, that disruption, the, the incident that we call disruption, like in detective fictions, you know. Mm -hmm. But in my film, I think the role of uh, disruption is really, really different mm -hmm. because uh, it, 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 it plays another role. It plays, as I said, as a, you know, twist in some part of the story without leaving any trace. But why, I mean, should we... Uh, consider, you know, such a, um, you know, bringing in such twist in our film. I think when we talk about uh, some specific subject matter like Middle East and oil, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, this really um, makes you think of some incoherency because of their nature. And, uh, you know, uh, Middle East acts like an uh, you know, amorphous creature is like, you know, with those many hands and legs and, you know, it's so unpredictable. And mm. um, it's, um, you know, you're not certain about anything and you are waiting for the worst to come and the worst hasn't come yet. <laughs> so um, that's why I think that kind of incoherency and the mysterious way of telling things is... Um, you know, leading you to to make such a uh, you know uh, to 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 have such narrative structure, and the, the, you know there are so many plot holes that coming from the narrative of Middle East. That's why mm -hmm. I chose um, you know to use that kind of mystery in, in inside my uh, you know narrative, and also I think um, oil itself, you know, induces some sort of uh, you know, structural irresolution, if I want to use uh, Nick Land's term, uh, he, he describes the totally. labyrinth, yeah, labyrinth structure as a, you know, kind of irresolutional structure. So this induces that kind of, um, uh, you know, structure to the narrative. And uh, because of its dual property, when you think of the oil, it lubricates the narrative at the same mm -hmm. time. Uh, it intoxicates everything, and it it acts as an outsider that is, uh, you know, is, you know, lurks in your uh, narrative and comes up to the surface, and um, you know, intoxic intoxicate everything, and uh, have had uh, has this kind of chaotic presence with it uh, itself. And whenever you think that a conclusion might, you know seem I mean to come into view yeah it moves on to new gesture and you know mm. kind of changed your line of thought yeah that's such that's trip. why it's so uh, incoherent I think and yeah you it, don't know where it's like the evil's coming from it's like oh my goodness <laughs> yeah, yeah you don't know anywhere it. like oil is such a monster anywhere. I'm gonna get a t-shirt that says oil is a monster <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. Um, yeah, we like have another source from question. the ground, but like also it's unattainable in a way. It's, it's coming from the ground and it's unattainable, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's like so deep. Um, <laughs> there's a question uh, for Lucia, which is, can you speak about why you chose the three featured landscapes and their sequencing? Yeah, um, so the first sequence is in Las Vegas and I chose this location originally because I worked in close proximity to Bourbon Street in the French Quarter for a number of years. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I- I just I, miss it there. I just miss that part. <laughs> um, okay, I'll be okay. <laughs> but I, um, I, yeah, I originally filmed a different video that I never released actually, um, that was shot on Bourbon Street with a kind of similar premise where I got drunk off a of daiquiri and I had my friend just like follow me around and interact with the street. Um, and then, yeah, I wanted to make like kind of a more grandiose version of that. So I thought mm -hmm. the Vegas Strip is kind of like a giant version of Bourbon Street. That's uh, so but true, it's also, my God, that's so true. Yeah, but it's also yeah. this like desolate capitalist utopia in the middle of the desert. And yeah. it's like such a, yeah, easy representation of yeah, American excess. Um, and and so yeah, I, I chose it for that reason and trying to imagine my role in that moment as like a a noise musician Vegas showgirl. <laughs> yes. <laughs> my, my own interpretation of that. Yes. Um, and then 
for the next scene that was shot in the Chisos Mountains of uh, Big Bend National Park, mm -hmm. like right on the border of Texas and Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. My initial desire to film there was to just have like an epic canyon in the background. Um, and this also has to do with <laughs> the title, which is the bottom, which refers to a few different things, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's also a, a valley, like a physical valley between mm -hmm. canyons. Um, and so I wanted that, yeah, that kind of like empty space that is epic behind me, kind of like facing the sublime, like human um, in the backdrop of nature. And, um, but then also things I learned about the space by going there where that, yeah, it's so close to the border and it's like this ambiguous space between Mexico and the US. Um, and it's also part of um, the desert range, the Sonora Desert, where a lot of people cross over into the US. Um, and so it's this like very beautiful landscape that also has this like treacherous darkness to it um, because it's it's a physical border created by the landscape and not like a, a built wall by humans. Um, but yeah, these weren't, intentions in one making the film, but there are things I learned about the space as I was doing it. Um, the third location, I filmed on Lake Pontchartrain in New Orleans. Um, I wanted to film this in the middle of the ocean, but I did what was in my means. <laughs> and so Lake Pontchartrain is big enough that it looks like it doesn't end and that it is an ocean. Um, and I like that, yeah, it's kind of like a pathetic version of the ocean, but it's also very pretty. And, um, especially around sunset when we filmed it. Saw an alligator in the water while I was filming. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. Um, it didn't come to us though. And yeah, my original, original vision was to be in a boat and to just be kind of lost at sea, kind of imagery, just like very alone. But then I found this rubber ducky at a store and I was like, I should make this like, a little bit more funny or like can't be. So that's where I went with that. Um, the sequence is, hmm, I don't know, I, I didn't plan the sequence or, uh, originally and it just mm -hmm. kind of flowed at, in the editing process, um, which is my favorite part of making a film because I usually don't work with storyboard. Um, yeah, I don't storyboard either, but yeah. it's I assembled in the editing. Yeah. Oh, makes it fun. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's it's long that long. is amazing. That is amazing. And oh my goodness, we've got a lot of questions. It's not from my mom, which is like a surprise because I'm like waiting for my mom to be like, I want to see like all the questions. Actually, me too. I'm waiting for my mom as well. I know, like our mothers have to like join in at a certain point. Um, but this is for Susan and it says, uh, there's a sense of the untouched land and nature and the stained sheets and oil in the film's visual landscapes and images. Can you speak about this tension? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> These are good well, questions. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, there's always um, this kind of tension between untouched and you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, uh, I think they all come from a hesitation in not knowing what to do. I mean, all this tension, all these things are, come, are coming from a hesitation, from not knowing to do what, not not knowing what to do with with mm -hmm. this brand new body, mm -hmm. you know. So, I mean, um, as Amanda said, um, it's it's very unknown. I mean, it's it's something uh, unusual. Therefore, there's always this tension between fear. There's always this tension between, um, you know, um, you know, different layers of things because of not knowing what to do, not accepting the reality. There's some sort of, you know, manipulated reality that, that kind of create that kind of tension, I think. Mm -hmm. That's so I mean, true. entering that territory. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. Yeah. 
were you thinking about that as you were shooting and uh, with your uh, cinematographer, do you feel like you guys had that sort of sense of the theme and what you were doing whilst you were doing it? Like you knew what it was already or were you finding that out while you were shooting it? I think in my case that we we, re we really decided on so many things uh, on the Beforehand. set. Beforehand. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, but but also in editing. So I remember a discovery uh, in the editing room. That's awesome. Exactly, because uh, the structure I um, chose for editing, I think my my producer, one mm. of my producers, he's also a filmmaker and he really kind of advised me not to choose this kind of incoherent structure because mm -hmm. uh, he always was telling me that you will confuse your uh, audience <laughs> and uh, uh, and the audience uh, I, is smart though and I was telling him smart. that yeah they are really smart and yeah. also I deliberately want to have that kind of structure because of the nature of the yeah, you're like, that's and the whole oil, point as I told you <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, like, that's the, the whole point of it the rest of my life. yeah Welcome and <laughs> and it was it was really interesting because when I was writing the script um, yeah. I had this term uh, in my mind uh, the ancient enemy I don't know if you've heard of that from the book uh, uh, Phantom the Phantoms called uh, yeah. written by Dean Koontz I think. Wow, wow. Um, That's so cool. The ancient yeah, the, enemy. That's this, awesome. Yeah, this uh, this word was, uh, I mean, uh, this book is about uh, this guy who's a paleontologist, I mean, a renegade paleontologist, who um, is also a uh, tablet writer mm -hmm. and researching on this unnamed being, which is responsible for the disappearance of so many people in a village in Colorado, I think. And that um, unnamed being actually um, resembles, I mean, uh, resembles um, oil, you know. Right. Um, For sure. Yeah. I mean, and they, they, they say that it is oil, I mean, in the book. I mean, so. so intense. Um, but th that term was always in my mind. And mm -hmm. I was thinking, what if I could create a narrative? Uh, which has, I mean, what if I could create an enemy for my narrative? Mm. You know, like um, it's like in getting the uh, autoimmune disease when mm. your body is mistakenly, you like know, attacking, attacking itself. <laughs> Exactly. So how can I attack? Yeah. Exactly. How can I attack uh, my my narrative with with its own content? You know, mm. so. Uh, that, that that's how uh, I I uh, I thought. Okay, if I write about Middle East, I'm sure mm. this, you know, there there will be so many plot holes, and yeah, and also th th there's there's another thing that really impacted. I had had a, had a re really great impact on me. I think was uh, the movie The Biggest Sleep. By Howard oh my Hawks. god, yes. That's like why we're yeah. all here. Like why we all get out of it. Yeah. Actually, is that Howard Hawks yeah, movie? Yeah. I mean, sleep, it was it was very um confusing actually. It's, it's like completely uh, of a, inspiring on that level, yeah. That's exactly. So cool. It's confusing and there are mm -hmm. so many unsolved things. But it's really good because it always gives you this potential that you mm -hmm. think that there's this alien presence everywhere and you don't know the cause of so many things mm -hmm. and there's a murder of a driver even that Raymond Chandler the writer of the book you know he, he's asked to you know uh, how this murder happened how mm. how you know this driver is being killed he says I don't know <laughs> so you you shouldn't uh, have you know mm, I mean, resolve everything in your movie. Please, it's I mean. not like math. Yeah. It's not like in chemistry <laughs> class doing your formulas. Exactly. This is art. So, That's why so I, like, I told my, my producer, <laughs> yeah, they're so smart and you shouldn't do that. Yeah. Yeah, the audience, like a two-year-old is smarter than we give them credit for. It. So it's like, you know, our grandfather who needs to see the film and needs it to be something that is left open for him to interpret on his deathbed. Also, I feel like um, 
we've been talking for I guess an hour which is crazy because it feels like five minutes and also um, I have there's another if you guys can go for a little bit longer there's another question if that's cool with y'all mm -hmm. um, yeah because I could do this all day um, but there was a question that was about like the mother-daughter relationship in your movie Susan if you wanted to talk about that yeah yeah, it's, it's a little bit strange because um, there's that kind of, um, I mean, they seem so indifferent toward each other and uh, oil is there, such a vital substance and it's just there to solve their, you know, some small family issues, not many, they're not small, I mean, um, it, it's there just to solve their relationship, I think, and mm -hmm. based, I mean, with, with using... I mean, oil, um, she wants to help her daughter to, you know, em, you know, you know, leave the country. But, uh, but their attitude toward each other, they seem very cold, I think. And they, they act so passively. Yes. It's like the opposite relationship yeah. that I have with my mother, which is so warm and so <laughs> But, you know, it's really yeah. interesting that um, there's that film Orange um, or August in Osage County. It's based on a play and Meryl Streep played this very terrible mother in it. And, you know, when she was interviewed about it, they asked her saying, why would you place a mother who's so cold when you're such a warm mother? And she said, well, I have friends who have mothers who were cold and, you know, they had a really difficult life because they had cold mothers. And I was like, oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> so deep so it's important to show all aspects of all different kinds of relationships and it's profound that you did that yeah. in leakage it's really important i think um there's also a question for meryl speaking of meryl streep our own meryl streep that we have here with us <laughs> the young meryl streep meryl in the 70s except you're much cuter than her and much more beautiful um, <laughs> but there's a question for you saying can you give yours a review of the panel discussion yeah. reclamation and resilience because that's the one coming up which we're excited about and i'm watching it so yes it's coming up on tuesday um there's going to be two filmmakers um that we'll be speaking with from the section um rituals of reclamation so they have two short films uh one is patricia montoya who's mm -hmm. filmed um when la romerosa quiet mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, from Mexico and kind of looks at what happens when women speak up against sexual uh, assault and violence. Mm -hmm. And then um, Gian Halasi's film Mother, Daughter, Sister, which is a documentary shot in um, Myanmar, Bangladesh, in refugee camps uh, of women from Myanmar who have fled the Burmese military and are victims of state-sponsored violence and their ways of kind of coming together to collectively heal and act, be activists against um, state-centered violence. It's like rape is a war tactic, basically. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we'll be joined with um, two specialists um, from La FASA, um, Louisiana Foundation Against Sexual Assault, and um, the International uh, Rescue Committee so that deals with immigrants and people coming, refugees coming from other places to kind of speak about these things from a Louisiana perspective, a U.S. perspective, and draw those correlations. So that'll be Tuesday at uh, 7 p.m. Central Time. We would love to see you there. This is so vital, you guys. This work is so important, and everyone is doing such a great job. Thank you guys so much for being part of this. Yeah, it means the world to me that we can sit you. together and talk about these ideas. It's so important. I wish we could do this all day. I know. <laughs> I know. Great. Thank you all. Can you guys come to my house and just move in? <laughs> Be there in a few months. Okay. <laughs> It's also. I will wonderful. definitely come. <laughs> yes, that's it. We're bonded. We like yeah. it. And it's like for real. That's so true. And we love New Orleans too. And we're sending so much love out there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, thank for showing you. up. It's a heart. Oh, the way so thank you. Cinema heart. I love the cinema. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Be well, yes. everybody. I love you all. I wish I could thank you all so much. Thank you. Nice to meet you.